psychological study from the National Institute of Mental Health. Just this morning alone, there's a long time The circle of depression is growing wider, broader. 15% of women suffer from this disorder. Abnormalities in the neurotransmitters. Six million American kids take prescribed medication. But what if the criminal is mentally ill? The punishment, a form of aversion therapy. Ten occurs on the show, but I want to. OCD, oppositional defiant disorder. Schools criticized for oversight. Everywhere you look, there it is. Think psychiatry has nothing to do with you? Think again. The whole field of psychiatry has gotten into every facet of your life. They basically believe that everyone is mentally ill. You smoke too much, it's a disease. You are too unhappy, it's a disease. You're too thin, it's a disease. You're too fat, it's a disease. Where are these coming from? These are coming from the minds of psychiatrists that are dreaming these things up writing papers and, get, and getting published with their names on it, calling, creating these new diseases. First he said that I had ADD. Then he said that I was depressed. Then he said I might be bipolar, but I don't have ADD anymore. And he said, you know, I've been noticing you, and I, I wonder if you have it too. What they decided is that both my husband and my son had a chemical imbalance that needed to be corrected with a chemical balancer. There is not one shred of credible evidence that any respectable scientist would consider valid demonstrating that anything that psychiatrists call mental illness are brain diseases or biochemical imbalances. It's all fraud. There is no reliability of diagnosis and there is no science. It's just pseudoscience. It's pretend science. This is one of the most open secrets in all of America in the psychiatric field that nothing, nothing is being done this legitimate and they're billing for it. Psychiatrists claim that over one billion of the world's population is mentally ill. In the past 30 years, they have prescribed psychiatric medications to 543 million people. And right now, they drug 17 million school children with stimulants and antidepressants. When recently asked about the scientific basis of their profession, those psychiatrists willing to be interviewed offered no nothing but excuses. Psychiatric uh, illness is, uh, is not really an uh, illness. How do you uh, evaluate if someone is cured or, or sick? Cure is certainly something we look forward to and we had no earthly idea how to accomplish. We're not good at causes. We don't know what causes mental illness. But that hasn't stopped them from pronouncing themselves mental health experts and treating people against their will. And the results? This psychiatrist, man who's supposed to work to heal people, has done nothing but destroy this man's life, and in destroying his life, destroying the lives of all of his loved ones. Excuse me. They've damaged and ruined my son, and they've trapped him in a system. The way that they treated him and made him feel like he was worthless. Riot was being kept dumb and, and high on Ritalin so that they could make $2,500 per month. He gave me Valium, and um, I got addicted to it. It wiped out my life. My life has been ruined. Uh, my joy has been stolen. She was lying there. She took two two gasps of air and died right there in front of me. It is really tragic. It's awful. And it's being done for money. That's why it's being done. Oh, it's got to be in the billions. I don't know the exact number, but it's got to be in the billions. It's, it's just unbelievable. This is so big that it's, it buckles the mind. Take the human tragedy you have just seen and multiply it by the millions. In the past four decades, nearly twice as many Americans have died in government psychiatric hospitals than in all U.S. wars since 1776. Insurance companies pay out $69 billion every year for psychiatric services, doubling the cost of medical insurance premiums. And while raking in over $2 trillion annually, psychiatrists cannot point to a single cure. 
Hard to believe? That's exactly what they count on. And as we will show you, it's how they have been getting away with it from the very beginning. The roots of psychiatry have to do with control, power, and alienation from certain groups of people who were uncomfortable to be around. They were locked up in these places to get them out of the way. Uh, the history of psychiatry, I think, really is related to institutions. Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London was one of the world's first psychiatric institutions. Commonly referred to as Bedlam, the hospital was little more than a warehouse for those deemed mad. Inmates were confined to cages, closets, and animal stalls, chained to walls, and flogged, while the asylum charged admission for public viewings. In the 18th century, William Batty was the first to promote that his institutions could cure the mentally ill. Batty's madhouses made him one of the richest men in England, though his treatments were every bit as inhumane as those practiced in Bedlam, with not a single patient cured. His financial success triggered a boom in the asylum business and an opportunity for psychiatrists to cash in on this new growth industry. This was an era where, on both sides of the Atlantic, specialized institutions for the mentally ill are beginning to be built in large numbers. Those institutions date back certainly to the beginning of the 18th century and in a few cases even earlier than that. Uh, but the explosive growth of an asylum sector, of asylumdom as some historians have called it, is very much a, a 19th century phenomenon. Uh, it's that period when the state is persuaded to invest tax dollars in building these places. But while those who ran the institutions were getting rich, psychiatrists yet lacked the credibility to maximize their cash flow. In order to justify their profession, they needed to come up with these biological solutions, or they didn't, didn't have any profession. The only way for them to solve that was to attempt to start uh, believing that, that these people that were suffering from emotional disorders was from, from a biological basis. Whatever was done to make this person more manageable would be simply called a treatment. And the sad reality is that many of these so-called treatments were, in essence, torture. The near-drowning devices that were developed in this period, for example, must have been appallingly frightening. For example, one device involved putting the patient into a coffin, closing the lid, and dumping it into a bath of water. and then opening it up and trying to revive the patient. But there were a range of these things and the mortality rate was, was very, very high. Psychiatrists next sought to give credence to their practices by cloaking them in the language of medicine. This repackaging of treatment became known as the medical model. Somebody who's really hyper and manic, uh, if you're wrapped up in a cold sheet and dunked into some water, you're going to quit acting manic because that's a punishing uh, treatment. So, but as soon as the symptoms started to go away, they started to believe that somehow by wrapping them up and dunking them in cold water, it was um, draining the toxics out of their body. So they built the medical model around that. Pushing the biological theory of mental illness a step further, an American, Benjamin Rush, put forth the idea that insanity was caused by too much blood in the head. The cure? Remove the blood by any means possible. Restraint, cold water, bleeding, even terror. And with that, a new medical model was created. Benjamin Rush was probably the most famous American physician of the revolutionary era. Uh, Rush was known as the master bleeder. He bled his patients for madness. He also invented something called the tranquilizer. It's a chair that looks a little bit like an electric chair. The patient was confined in this apparatus 
uh, sometimes with cold water applied to his or her head for some hours at a time and Rush announces in a letter that he's invented this new contraption and dubbed it the tranquilizer. Rush's often lethal procedures were detailed in his 1812 textbook, which remained psychiatry's authoritative source for the next 70 years. He was so revered that in 1965, Rush was enshrined as the father of American psychiatry on the seal of the American Psychiatric Association. As the 1800s wore on, psychiatry's mounting failures at curing madness threatened their financial bottom line, forcing them to invent new medical models. The cures promised when it was delivered. So by the 1860s and 70s, a growing mood of pessimism was covering Europe and North America, that effectively the new institutions were ever growing in size, but not growing in their effectiveness. The 20th century brought more medical models. American psychiatrist Henry Cotton mutilated his patients by removing their body parts, declaring this a breakthrough in the treatment of mental illness. The earliest target was the teeth and then the tonsils and the sinuses, but when patients didn't get better, the enthusiasts for this treatment then started to move down the body and to say, well, obviously patients have swallowed um, bacteria in their saliva, so stomachs need to go, spleens need to go, uh, colons need to go. As public outcry escalated over torture and maiming of patients, psychiatrists would invent new methods each one hailed as the miracle cure, but each one was ultimately proven no more effective nor less brutal than the last. This is a history of psychiatry, more or less, to, to damage the patient. I mean, this is a version of the original model, which was to chain them like animals. If you're doing it to somebody because you insist that they have to change, and you're gonna do that by turning the screws, you might say, whether it's with medication, restraint, whatever, that's torture. And a huge part of what psychiatry has done really comes down to torture. As the 20th century progressed, psychiatry would continue to seek legitimacy by transforming itself into a medical discipline. But they succeeded only in creating more efficient ways of inflicting mental and physical torture and death, a legacy that has carried forward into modern psychiatry with its most profitable medical model to date, the mass drugging of millions. But to do this, psychiatrists first had to shatter one of mankind's most cherished beliefs, decreeing that people were not what they thought they were. Leipzig University, Germany, 1879. Professor Wilhelm Wundt experiments on the human senses. Wundt declares man's thoughts, personality, and behavior are nothing more than chemical reactions in the brain. Wundt uh, became frustrated with his inability to change behavior because he was dealing with the original, you know, psychology. That's the psyche, that's the soul. He created a new science which was based on man being an animal without a soul to be trained. Not to be a thinker, but to be trained. Students from around the world gathered to study Wundt's new definition of man as a soulless organism. The spirit of the age was summed up by German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Gott is taught. Gott bleibt taught. Following Wundt's theory, a Russian, Ivan Pavlov, conducted animal experiments seeking methods to modify behavior. Pavlov studied in Wilhelm Wundt's laboratory in Leipzig, Germany, in the late 1800s. And he experimented with uh, dogs, you know, with electrodes and, and stimulus response, denying uh, 
privileges to denying rewards. And he noticed that when you brought out some food in front of animals, dogs in particular, that they would begin to salivate. So he'd ring the bell at the same time that he brought the food out, and then eventually, instead of bringing the food out, he just rang the bell, and of course the, the dogs got all excited. He called that a condition reflex. Pavlov's first human subjects were children. He punched holes in their cheeks to collect and measure their saliva. Pavlovian conditioning became one of the major foundations of a lot of behavioral science research in the 20th century. The idea that behavior could be controlled through repetitive conditioning became known as behaviorism. The behaviorists believe that all children are animals and can be trained as animals. This was the view of, of behaviorists. As a matter of fact, John Watson, the, the most famous of the uh, behaviorists, says that you have to treat human beings or look at human beings the way you would look at the ox you slaughter. See, the behavior is not interested in what's up in your head or your soul because they don't believe there is a soul. Watson's successor, Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner, believed all behavior could be manipulated to suit whatever ends the behavioral psychologist was seeking. Skinner developed what's called operant conditioning, where he um, was able to demonstrate you can change animal behavior by certain schedules of reinforcement, by giving them rewards at certain times, and then you can teach pigeons to play ping pong, for example, and you can teach rats to run mazes, and you can teach human beings to seek certain economic or societal rewards. Skinner could actually shape new behavior patterns and this actually was the sort of thing he quite soon became very famous for. Perhaps his most notorious experiment was the Skinner box. He was uh, designing the Skinner box which is something like a big plate there uh, but everything in its control, the temperatures controlled, the lights controlled and, and so on and the idea is then you uh, present children with certain stimuli that you want them to learn to react to. For nearly a year, Skinner isolated his daughter in a box similar to those he built for rats. The child was stimulated and had to respond in a certain way like, like, an, like a chicken or a rat in a cage because they firmly believe that children are animals. If you believe though that a, a child is a human being, you can't train him like a rat. Today, about $40 million a year in taxpayer money is paid out by the United States National Institute of Mental Health for behavioral psychology research. A total of 19 billion since 1948. With these funds, psychiatrists apply the same conditioning techniques developed by Pavlov, Watson, and Skinner. Case in point, a juvenile detention center where children are hooked up to 270 volt batteries and shocked in a procedure called aversion therapy. Antoine was having a number of problems because he was up at a center that was shocking him every time he did anything. There was a button on a little, almost like a TV remote that would be used and pushed. They will get an additional shock for trying to remove the electrode. So they're, they're expected to sit there and let this pa electricity pass through their skin without trying to remove it. If they yell in anticipation of the shock. They will shock the students an additional time for yell. The cost to, to send a student to Judge Rottenberg from New York is about 214000 per student. These students are tortured. They're given this electric shock therapy for no other reason but to inflict pain. Other techniques include administering electric shock to treat sexual deviance, sending powerful magnetic impulses through the skull to interrupt brain activity, and shooting high voltage through surgically implanted electrodes, all to stifle problem behavior, and costing up to $100,000 per patient. And while this science without a soul led to behavior modification techniques that continue to generate billions in research and treatment, it also laid the groundwork for another psychiatric movement that would cause the deaths of millions. January 1945, as World War II comes to a close, the full horror of Hitler's final solution is exposed. With grotesque killing factories, unparalleled in human history, 
Mass graves filled with corpses of men, women, and children, murdered by starvation, bullets, and poison gas. What could drive men to commit such atrocities against their fellow human beings? The answer is the pseudoscience called eugenics, created and promoted by psychiatrists decades before the Nazis came to power. The eugenics movement got started in 1883 with Francis Galton, and he felt that human beings should take evolution in their own hands and that the most talented individuals, the most healthy individuals, the most attractive individuals should have more offspring. There was great concern that people that they considered had poor genes were reproducing faster than the people they considered had good genes. They felt that a medical solution might be the proper one. This is what led to the sterilization movement. It resulted in sterilization of mentally ill people, sterilization of retarded people, sterilization of people we don't like politically and sociologically. So the problem is not with genetics. The problem is a pretend phony genetics used to justify inhumane social policies. Though never proven as anything but theory, by the early part of the 20th century, eugenics had spread to almost 30 countries, from England to Brazil, Mexico, Sweden, Russia, and most notably, the United States, where forced sterilization was widely practiced. Eugenics movement in Germany was somewhat different than the eugenics movement in the United States in that uh, there were many more physicians and psychiatrists Alfred Plutz was one of the pioneers in the German eugenics movement and how to control the population of those whom he considered inferior. In 1905, along with uh, his brother-in-law, Ernst Rudin, he established the first uh, organization for uh, racial hygiene. Alle Nationen haben sich mit einer außergewöhnlich großen Menge an minderwertigen, schwachen, kranken und verkrüppelten abzugeben. Durch kluge Gesetze über Sterilisation würden wir auch in der Lage sein, den vernünftigsten Weg der Zeugung herbeizuführen. Hitler was particularly impressed by American eugenicist Madison Grant. Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, was proclaimed by Hitler as his personal Bible. In his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler further hailed eugenics as the science that would rebuild the German nation. Dem ist es nicht erlaubt, seine Krankheit an seine Kinder weiterzugeben. Das Recht auf persönliche Freiheit wird durch seine Pflicht, die Rasse zu besitzen, eingeschränkt. The German eugenicists welcomed the Nazi uh, advent to power because the Nazi program could fund the very programs that they had in mind. The Nazis gave them political support, financial support, and uh, conversely, the psychiatrists gave the Nazis a medical justification for uh, their uh, genocidal policies. Something like 40% of German psychiatrists had joined the SS by 1933. They weren't forced into the SS, they just joined it naturally, because the, because the beliefs were very, very similar. Rudin and his work led directly to the decision to move from sterilization to murder. Their plan was simple. First, convince the public that feeble-minded undesirables wanted to escape the burden of their existence, but could not say it, and that killing them was an act of mercy. Then extend the definition of inferior to include Jehovah's Witnesses, Jews, Gypsies, homosexuals, all unworthy of life. Psychiatrists produced propaganda movies known as the Nazi killing films, shown in all 5,300 theaters throughout Germany. Geisteskrankheit ist als ein Erdübel eine der größten Gefahren für die Volksgesundheit. Irrtum ist, dass sich solche Kranken glücklich fühlen und am Leben hängen. Sie haben überhaupt kein Daseinsbewusstsein. Wer von ihr befallen wird, dem ist die schwerste Last des Schicksals auferlegt. Ein Dasein ohne Leben. It first started with passive violence, which is starvation, 
It then intensified to lethal injections, and finally it developed into systematic gassing and cremation. Their headquarters were established in Berlin under the infamous code name T4. T4 program was named after Tiergarten 4, which essentially uh, resulted over a period of time in the murder of about 70,000 people who were deemed mentally retarded, emotionally distraught, or physically handicapped by the Germans. They were called life unworthy of living. The killing, piloted in psychiatric institutions across Germany, then moved into the concentration camps with top German psychiatrists as the executioners. Paul Nietzsche, the T4 director, declared, Das Aussortieren in den Konzentrationslagern lief einfach genauso ab wie in den Nervenheilanstalten. Und mit selbigen Erfassungsbögen. Six million Jews died in uh, concentration camps and as a result of Nazi extermination policies. Rudin uh, congratulated Hitler for making his, that is Rudin's, 30-year dream come true. After the Nazi surrender, an international court of justice was held to put psychiatry on trial for its war crimes. But American psychiatrists, fearing a permanent blow to the future of psychiatry, stepped in by shifting the blame onto a handful of German psychiatrists. There were some doctors who were uh, prosecuted, uh, but very few. Ernst Rudin uh, returned to Switzerland at the end of the war. He did not uh, serve any prison time. One of the strangest things of all about the legacy of Nazi science is that some of the nastiest uh, psychiatric eugenicists at the end of the war went back to work either in Germany or sometimes in the United States. What began with a psychiatric plan to eliminate undesirable humanity had now spread throughout the civilized world and was responsible for the murder of 11 million people. Never brought to justice, psychiatrists, as you will see, continued to advance eugenics around the world. And today we see the results in racism, human misery, and unending social conflict. After World War II, a new eugenics was resurrected out of the bones and ashes of the old eugenics. The eugenics movement has been at the forefront to establish a new scientific racism that justifies oppression and exploitation and racism. In fact, racism is inseparable from the roots of psychiatry. The entire history of psychiatry, beginning with scientific conclusions that were made in the 1830s, was an effort to prove the intellectual inferiority of African Americans. Benjamin Rush is the father of modern psychiatry. And he is the one that gave us the term nigritude. He said that all blacks have inherited this disease. And this particular disease, it caused them to be inferior. In addition to that, it was the reason why it was very important that blacks remain segregated and separate from whites so that whites did not inherit this disease. Asserting that negritude was a form of leprosy, Rush justified segregation as a medical necessity. And that became an argument to continue slavery. The fact that you have, uh, have brutalized a whole group of people had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with some genetic link and that basically you were just a diseased person. So when a slave master wanted to get rid of a, a recalcitrant slave, they could just say, oh, well, they're, they're suffering from this disease. Draptomania, that is the name of the mental disorder that was contrived by Samuel Cartwright, um, who said that blacks have a mental disorder if they had a desire to run away from slavery. Running away became such a uh, common problem that psychiatrists attempted to give that a disease. He says, well, that's a cure for that. And the answer was, the question was, well, what's the cure for that? Frequent whippings, frequent whippings. You'd be surprised how that disease clears up uh, when the lash is put in place of their excuses. After slavery was abolished, psychiatric racism not only persisted, it intensified. 
the American Journal of Psychiatry officially proclaimed that Negroes, as descendants of savages and cannibals, were ill-prepared for higher civilization, while their pseudoscience eugenics stepped up its racist activities. There is a clear and long and intimate connection between the eugenics movement and the Ku Klux Klan. Harry Laughlin, who was the Carnegie Institution's director of the eugenics record office, had close relationship to the Ku Klux Klan through the publication of a book called White America, which was written by a uh, major Klan leader. So Laughlin wrote a glowing review of the book in the eugenics news. Uh, and at the same time, you have the Ku Klux Klan using eugenics to justify their racist goals. But psychiatric racism wasn't exclusively American. Some of the worst abuses of the 20th century occurred in South Africa, where the government adopted the same racist theories and practices used by Hitler. This was no coincidence. The prime minister had studied eugenics as a psychology student in Nazi-influenced Germany in the 1920s. Dr. Hendrik Verwurst is regarded as the architect of apartheid. Uh, he saw South Africa as a divided state with whites, blacks, and brown people living in totally separate areas with uh, black people having no rights whatsoever. With apartheid in place, psychiatrists established mental hospitals throughout the country that were, in fact, nothing more than slave labor camps. These places operated under a private company by the name of Smith Mitchell and Company. They were saving money through the cheap accommodation for psychiatric patients while making massive fortune out of money that Parliament had appropriated for medication, so it was a corrupt system. When this operation was finally exposed, it was discovered that 67,000 prisoners had perished, while at the same time, psychiatrists had collected $117 million in funding from the South African government. The World Health Organization issued a report declaring that psychiatry cultivated racism and that apartheid did have a parallel in the ownership and trading of slaves. In 1971, in the United States, psychiatrist Louis Jolly West continued psychiatry's legacy of racism, hatching a secret aversion therapy experiment called the Violence Center. His government-funded plan, implant electrodes in the brains of African-American and Hispanic males to shock them should they exhibit any violent behavior. And if that didn't work, chemically castrate them with drugs. When West's racist proposal met with public outrage, the plan was quickly shelved. Though psychiatry's unrelenting racist theories were blunted, they were not stopped. In 1994, psychologist Richard Hernstein co-authored The Bell Curve, claiming to prove that blacks were genetically disabled and therefore inferior to whites. The Bell Curve um, really argues a very old eugenics idea. It argues that people are born with different kinds of intellectual abilities, that these are inborn pretty much at birth. It goes back to the notion that somehow black people are genetically and biologically inferior to white people as a way to justify what was really its pro programs of social racism and social sexism. And you see that kind of thinking going on in public school testing and IQ testing and educational testing and tracking. And this new tool fit into that old mold. It was a new tool that could prove the intellectual inferiority of African Americans. The psychiatric profession has done great damage, certainly in the past, and far too many in the present, too, to subvert democracy and perpetuate racial stereotypes even more, deep racism in society. We have to battle against this continual uh, misinformation, disinformation, pseudoscience, uh, it can be repackaged in whatever form or format it is, but if it is based solely upon the color of one's skin and then is the merit of that human being, I just reject it. And so today, the flame of hatred continues to burn, fueled by pseudo-scientific lies. This is the heritage of psychiatry as a justification for racism and as a pretext for political repression. We 
быть верными коммунистическим идеалам, убежденно, с революционной настойчивостью притворять в жизнь Ленинский завет, учиться коммунизму, трудиться самоотверженно, по-коммунистически, всей жизнью своей, утверждать на земле дело Ленина, дело партии. Ленемся! The Soviet regime demanded absolute loyalty. Those who did not tow the party line were considered dissidents and labeled enemies of the state. With no more than a whisper to the secret police, they would vanish into one of these special psychiatric hospitals. Despite the risks, these so-called dissidents put their ideas of freedom into action. Я вел жизнь тайную, конспиративную. Никто не знал, что я это делал. У меня была маленькая подпольная типография, и я стал делать листовки. While others considered themselves loyal Soviet citizens. Я, например, считал, что уверенно считал, что я один из лучших советских людей. Когда уже даже меня арестовали. According to Soviet psychiatrists, they all suffered from inflexibility of convictions, a symptom of a new disorder sluggish schizophrenia. Like their counterparts in other countries, the Soviet psychiatrists prescribed powerful drugs to cure their patients. Они никогда их с удовольствием не принимали. И находят пути их не принимать. Мы же обязаны просмотреть прием лекарства, потому что больные лекарства дошли до больного. Вот они где-то уже, как говорится, в горле проглатывают, все, ротовая полость чистая. И потом вот такие делают какие-то движения, отрыгивают. на обходе говорит как себя чувствуете петр петрович я говорю послушайте вот а, а там э, когда э, 5 кубиков галлоперидола то надо например, слюна до полу там перекошенность вся значит одни мышцы растягиваются другие сокращаются совершенно ужасные позы лицо все ужасное на душе страшно просто я человека вот самое главное описать описать это состояние невозможно санитары совершенно безнаказанно могли избивать по любому поводу или вообще без повода. Вот, например, э, санитар открывает дверь, э, и тут, э, тут ты оказался, например, в этом в проеме двери. И вот э, этого достаточно было, чтобы, скажем, получить удар. Если э, больной, э, скажем, оказывал сопротивление при избиении, то его могли привязать и привязывали, и уже избивали, и продолжали избивать уже привязанного. Проходит, допустим, год, два, там выписывает убийц, выписывает насильников. Михаил, ты бы лучше убил бы кого-нибудь, мне бы легче было тебя отсюда убытывать. Это было, вот, расстало такое чувство безысходности. From 1967 to 1987, the Soviet government arrested over two million people, who for political reasons were diagnosed as mentally sick and were forced to undergo psychiatric treatment. Even today, psychiatry remains the coercive tool of choice for governments throughout the world. What we've learned is that in Getmo or Guantanamo Bay, that we had teams of healthcare professionals called the biscuit teams, behavioral scientists, um, psychologists, working with the military to advise them on how far you could push a, a prisoner. There are abuses that have been documented around the world. We have healthcare professionals who have committed um, potentially um, 
acts of treason uh, within their medical ethics. And there's nobody supervising that. There's nobody making them stand accountable to their medical ethics. But psychiatrists have never reserved physical and mental torture exclusively for political prisoners. Throughout history, they have repackaged it and sold it to the public as therapy. Beginning in the 1920s, psychiatrists embraced a new group of procedures that claimed to work by creating intentional damage to the brain. Monfred Sockel had this notion that he could kill just the bad brain cells, that somehow we have good brain cells, we have bad brain cells. So if you give people enough insulin, you kill those bad brain cells. And if the person survived this epilepsy, they would be better off for it. Despite convulsions that caused severe spinal cord injuries in 40% of the patients, Sockel pointed to their childlike state and declared his treatment a success. Hospitals built insulin wards and coma therapy became big business. Not to be outdone, Ladislaus von Meduna of Hungary believed he could drive out mental illness by inducing brain damaging seizures with a drug called metrazole. He noticed his epileptics had no mental health problems and his mental health patients, his uh, psychiatric patients, seemed to have no epilepsy and so he thought doing one would obviate the other. The theory was that epilepsy and schizophrenia couldn't coexist in the same brain and that if epilepsy was induced, that a seizure was caused, it would, quote, drive out the schizophrenia. There's no scientific basis for this whatsoever. Metrazole was fast and lucrative. In a morning, a single psychiatrist could chemically shock 50 patients into a docile and manageable state. By 1939, metrazole was so popular with psychiatrists and staff, it was used in 70% of American hospitals and in almost every other country in the world. The financial success of insulin and metrazole sparked the development of an even more profitable method of inducing brain-damaging convulsions. How is electric shock therapy done? We use these electrodes. We place them on the patient's head like this. And then by means of this machine, we place a controlled electric current through the brain. Just for a fraction of a second. The patient doesn't feel it. The story behind this miracle cure began in a Roman slaughterhouse. In Italy, in 1938, uh, two uh, Italian psychiatrists decided to observe that before slaughtering pigs, in order to make the pigs more docile, they would apply electrodes to their temples that were hooked up to wall current, and uh, that this stunned the pigs, but it didn't kill them. And they could then slaughter them. Well, this gave them the encouragement to try inducing convulsions with electricity. We would see teeth falling out, broken spines, bones knocked out of joint, broken bones, and people even getting internal organ damage from being restrained while they were having these uncontrolled, writhing seizures, convulsions. Many patients have been returned to their homes and jobs who might still be here if it were not for this helpful form of treatment. Having successfully sold brain damage as a cure, psychiatrists search for even more precise ways of targeting the brain. This was jump-started in 1848, when an explosion blew a steel rod straight through the head of Vermont railway worker Phineas Gage. While Gage survived, his personality was dramatically altered. Seventy years later, Portuguese neurologist Igaz Moniz would try to obtain a similar result by drilling into a patient's skull and squirting pure alcohol directly into the brain killing the tissue of the frontal lobes. Moniz called this new procedure a lobotomy. Dr. Walter J. Freeman would become lobotomy's most infamous practitioner. He discovered he could do it faster without having to drill through the skull. 
there was no anesthesia. And he would just lift up the eye and stick uh, nothing more than an ice pick right into the brain, right under the orbital bone. And then just break the thing back and forth until he was satisfied that he had caused enough disruption of brain tissue and then pull it out. Freeman traveled the country in his lobotomobile, hacking apart his patients' brains on stage, or sometimes right there in the vehicle. And he would pull up and offer lobotomies to people, get referrals from the local doctors, or sometimes people didn't even go through doctors. They'd go right to the lobotomobile, and he would just do the brain damaging procedure right there. By the time his surgical privileges were revoked after his last patient died on the operating table, Freeman had performed or supervised over 3,500 lobotomies, more than 25% of which, by his own admission, left his patients in a vegetative state. They lobotomized a million people in the 40s and the 50s and beginning of the 60s until they came to the conclusion that this was a destructive treatment. But though the stories of miraculous cures were soon exposed as brain-damaging frauds, psychiatrists kept one step ahead, inventing new forms of psychosurgery passed off as medical advances. I completely shudder from head to toe. And that's what I heard in my head when he, but he drilled something in my, in my brain. Northwest, actually, the center home. So I have to do that. Yeah. Why did you have to do that? I went, oh, funny and all. Did you? My head all shook inside. Oh, dear. All oh, my head shook inside. Yes, so all right. right. Everything shook, the eyes, everything, the teeth. Oh, that's well, That was grievous bodily harm done to my brain. Mm -hmm. And nobody has the right anyway to pray God with somebody's brain. The whole operation took about eight and a half hours and they kept me awake for every second of it. And I remember every second of it. And I still remember it to this day because I have this operation every day of my life. Whether I like it or not, I have it. Psychiatrists still tout the benefits of lobotomy, a treatment that earns them $31 million annually. But in the wake of lobotomy's tarnished reputation, psychiatrists were quick to push electroshock back into the spotlight. Renaming it electroconvulsive therapy, they now give patients anesthetics to squash their screams and paralyzing agents to avoid watching the writhing of agony. The main misconception that people have about ECT is that it's new and improved. The new and improved refers strictly to these uh, cosmetic improvements because, in fact, they make it easier on the witnesses. The person isn't shaking all over the table. They're paralyzed now. It isn't new. It isn't improved. It is worse. Every 10 years or so, there tends to be, uh, first of all, a denial that it causes any harm. Secondly, an acknowledgement that it might have caused harm, but here's a whole new approach, and now this one is blameless without any research to back it up. The ECT machine can pr produce anywhere from 50 to 400 volts. It's the kind of energy that we use for industrial machinery that might be in a steel mill or, some, or a printing press, some large piece of machinery. It's an extraordinary amount of energy and it causes a great deal of damage. And while stories of prisoners physically mistreated with electroshock are well publicized, the amount of electricity doled out by psychiatrists for ECT is up to 33 times greater. And that damage is most often targeted at the most vulnerable. Two thirds of those who receive electroshock are women. Given such diagnoses as premenstrual syndrome, menopausal disorder, or postpartum depression. Half of electroshock patients are elderly. Once they become eligible for government health care at age 65, 360% more American seniors receive ECT than at age 64. And what does this all add up to? 40,000 dead and countless others so brain damaged they have no hope of ever recovering a normal life. For a total of $12 worth of electricity, psychiatrists in the United States alone rake in $5 billion. But the next miracle cure psychiatrists added to their arsenal made them more money than ever before.
for it was faster, cheaper, and could turn every man, woman, and child into a patient for life. By the early 1950s, psychiatrists discovered their next miracle cure. A chemical originally designed to kill parasites in pigs, their new discovery hindered brain function in much the same way as shoving an ice pick into the eye socket. It was an old treatment in a new disguise. With the advent of these new tranquilizing drugs, it seems not too much to say that we're on the verge of an entirely new era in the treatment of mental illness. Dubbing it a chemical lobotomy, Canadian psychiatrist Heinz Lehmann described Thorazine as a simple, easy-to-take pill with the same effects as psychosurgery, but without the mess. Thorazine provided psychiatry with the entry into mainstream medicine. It had its magic bullet. If I'm a psychiatrist and I have to spend an hour talking to someone at psychotherapy, there's only so much I can charge for that hour. But if I can come in, give you a pill, and send you back out in 15 minutes or 10 minutes, that's a much more efficient uh, use of my time monetarily. What psychiatrists didn't tell the public was that Thorazine caused a crippling neurological condition known as tardive dyskinesia. And that's a neurological syndrome where you have muscle twitches, abnormal jerks, which are uncontrolled, and they either last for a long time or sometimes they're permanent. So that's very clear, very well recognized, long-term or permanent brain damage from these medications. Uh, Mr. Blount has virtually no signs of his original illness now. The signs that uh, the movements of his mouth are completely side effects of the drugs that he was on for 20 years. Uh, Mr. Blount is quite rational. He understands what's going on. Um, and if you're patient, he can carry on a very rational conversation with you. Even when you remove the drug, it may still remain. It means you have caused a permanent disabling of the brain. In the late 50s, you get the first signs of it, people starting to worry about it. But it's not until the late 70s that, that psychiatrists start warning their patients about it. 20 years. Thorazine's manufacturer, Smith Klein French, had good reason to keep a lid on the bad news. In the first year alone, SKF saw a 3,000% return on their original investment. With the public and the press kept in the dark about the severe and disabling side effects, prominent doctors and psychiatrists met in Puerto Rico to lay the groundwork for the expansion of psychiatric drugs far into the future. Psychiatrist Dr. Nathan Klein wrote this in the conference's final report. The present breadth of drug use may be almost trivial when we compare it to the possible number of chemical substances that will be available for the control of selective aspects of man's life in the year 2000. Dr. Klein spearheaded a movement flooding new psychiatric wonder drugs onto the global marketplace, backed by a massive publicity machine spending hundreds of millions of dollars. Psychiatry was now an industry of drug pushers. By 1970, the American Psychiatric Association was so dependent on drug company money that 30% of its annual budget came from pharmaceutical advertisements in its official journals. So we had money flowing to trade organizations, we had money flowing to the doctors, um, and to their journals. Well, we all know that that is going to influence how they think. The majority of National Institute of Mental Health and National Institute of Health scientists are getting more money from drug companies on the side than their tax-based salary. With so much money to be made, all psychiatrists needed was a scientific theory to justify it. Their solution? An official report declaring that all mental problems derive from a so-called chemical imbalance in the brain, requiring drugs to correct. This chemical imbalance is one of the greatest fallacies ever foisted upon patients and the public. There is no chemical test to show an imbalance related to any psychiatric disease, whether it's depression, anxiety, what have you. The chemical imbalance is for the benefit of the psychiatrist. It has to be there so the psychiatrist can treat it. 
But fraudulent chemical imbalance theories could not hide the mounting evidence of common and terrifying side effects, such as akathisia. Akathisia is like an extreme nervous, inner nervous agitation. People describe it as wanting to crawl out of their own skins. And this happens with great frequency, and it is absolutely, totally well understood to be associated with suicide and violence and homicide. After years of these reported side effects and cases upon cases of violence, self-mutilation, and death, in 1991, health experts, legislators, and the public finally forced the FDA to order an investigation. I know with absolute certainty that if Charles had any idea of the side effects of Prozac, he would never have taken it. I had two sons, David Lee, age eight, Billy 16, the wife 20 years old, gone. I'll tell you why. After being on Prozac for 21 days, my wife shot and killed both of these two boys right here. She turned the gun to herself and shot herself twice. I took the 9mm automatic, sat down on the bed and put the gun to my head, and I blew a 4-inch hole out the back of my arm instead of my head. Thank God I was a lousy shot. Had someone looked further into Prozac, steps could have been taken to avoid it. What was supposed to be an unbiased hearing was a panel of psychiatrists, the vast majority with personal financial ties to pharmaceutical companies. They basically couldn't find an expert, a doctor, a psychiatrist, at a, um, a leading medical school who basically in some way or another didn't have a consulting agreement, hadn't taken money from uh, the pharmaceutical companies. I do not find from the evidence today that there is credible evidence to support a conclusion that antidepressant drugs cause the emergence and or the intensification of suicidality and or other violent behaviors. 500 deaths, 33 murder cases, and over 20,000 adverse side effects. Would you like to tell me why this drug is still on the market? Is there an, an, a, an alliance, an unholy alliance between psychiatric community, the pharmaceutical industry, and the FDA? And the answer is yes. This unholy alliance became all too apparent in 1997, when pharmaceutical companies persuaded the FDA to allow them to advertise directly to the public, with psychiatrists providing medical endorsement. And in just three years, sales of psychiatric drugs skyrocketed almost two and a half times. When the numbers of violence and suicide victims shot through the roof, public outrage finally forced the FDA to issue warning labels on antidepressants. But by then, 13 years had passed, billions of dollars had been made, and psychiatrists were marketing their next wonder drugs. Over 8% of the world's population has now taken psychiatric drugs, backed up by fake science and endorsed by regulators who are bought and paid for. Their harmful medications gross nearly $27 billion a year. And while psychiatrists were finding a way to diagnose and drug every person on the planet, on another front, they were continuing their assault on our most personal freedoms. Psychiatrists demand the absolute right to determine what is best for the so-called mentally ill. After all, the mentally ill are crazy and unable to evaluate their own treatment. To enforce their authority over others and keep their institutions filled at profitable levels, psychiatrists use a method called involuntary commitment. When you go to a real doctor, say a family doctor or a cardiologist, a patient always has the right to refuse treatment. So there is no such thing as involuntary treatment when it comes to clinical medicine as practiced by real doctors. Psychiatrists, of course, believe that people can be treated against their will. In 1956, psychiatrist Winfred Overholzer presented a plan to Congress intended to take involuntary commitment to a whole new level. The plan purchase a million acres of Alaskan wilderness, build a huge mental asylum, and change the commitment laws so that anyone could be shipped off with no more than a simple nod from a psychiatrist. 
the bill sailed through the House of Representatives, but when the public caught wind of the plan, they became enraged, referring to it as Siberia, USA. The bill was quickly struck in the Senate. But while the death of the Siberia bill put a stop to their large-scale plans, involuntary commitment still remained the most effective and profitable method for filling psychiatric institutions. Again, the person has committed no crime and has no trial and is sent directly to a mental hospital, which is really a prison. How many people go to an insane asylum and say, please lock me up? Doctors don't lock up anybody. Psychiatrists lock you up. Even children can be taken from their parents with little legal recourse. They just invaded our home. They came in with officers. Our kids were scared. You know, they come in with a piece of paper and say, you're giving us your kids. And it's like, you know, how can they just come in and do that? She said, you could be arrested for medical neglect. And I said, but how was that when, you know, this is my child? And I, and I see that he doesn't need that much medication. Why would you threaten me with something like that? At 10 p.m., two policemen and two social workers came to my house and took all four of my kids away. Once committed to psychiatric hospitals, patients are drugged and restrained. The more a person objects, the more this objection is construed as symptom of a mental illness. At which point the person would be locked up in restraints. There would be the ankle, the knee, the waist, the head, the wrist, and the shoulder restraints. And if when that process was happening, if there was almost any resistance at all, the person then would be medicated to a point where they would, be, they would almost be knocked out. We had one case where they actually took a patient in a seclusion room and beat him up. And then uh, they lied about it to the uh, services that investigated. So it's a pretty wide range of of abuse issues that we've encountered. Psychiatric staff provoke their patients into violence so they can bill insurance companies up to $1,600 a day for each restrained patient. A patient would resist diagnosis, resist treatment, and also want to leave treatment while they were at the hospital. And invariably, every time, that person's situation would be exacerbated until they were put in constraints and medicated, at which point there would be documented reasons to keep that person in treatment. The burden of such claims is passed directly to the public in the form of soaring health care premiums. As for their victims, the experience is traumatic and even lethal. 16-year-old Rochelle Claiborne died in Laurel Ridge's care last August. The state report shows during the restraint, quote, Rochelle stated several times she could not breathe. In almost all respects, the, sta the staff uh, behaved appropriately, followed the standards. By taking advantage of weak or vague restraint laws, psychiatrists and their staff are almost never held criminally liable for assault, battery, and murder. He begged me to take him home, take him out of there, that they were treating him wrongly, and uh, he didn't want to stay there. And I got a call that there had been an accident that they held him down until he couldn't breathe anymore. I wish I would have listened to him, take him out of there before it had happened. And then I miss him every day. And I wish I could have him back, but I can't. To this day, no one has been charged for the child's murder. The elderly are a prime target for psychiatric abuse, with treatment of senior citizens in mental institutions costing private and government insurance over $29 billion a year. Unwarranted commitment has occurred. It wouldn't have occurred if the people hadn't had insurance. The proof of that pudding is generally in how fast they get out once the insurance runs out. Involuntary commitment is a form of psychiatric slavery where persons are treated as if they're property and they are deprived of liberty and people are making money in the process. As long as we have involuntary mental hospitalization, Psychiatry is a prison work. It's a crime against humanity. It is not medicine. Every minute of every day, someone is involuntarily committed to a psychiatric institution. And if you think this is something that can't happen to you or someone you know, think again. Every 75 seconds, someone in America has been committed against their will. And with over a trillion dollars allocated to U.S. hospitals since 1965, 
psychiatrists have carved out for themselves a lucrative commercial enterprise, hidden behind a dubious interpretation of the law. But all too often, psychiatrists commit crimes too blatant to be ignored. The FBI has raided the headquarters of one of the nation's largest operators of psychiatric hospitals. Hundreds complained of overbilling, misdiagnosed conditions, and insurance fraud. Investigators say they found more than 5,000 similar cases in all 50 states. Psychiatrists clearly are getting rich. Psychiatrists traded drugs for sex, filed false insurance claims, and exploited patients sexually. We have uncovered some of the most elaborate, aggressive, creative, deceptive, immoral, and illegal schemes being used to fill empty hospital beds with insured and paying patients. Every psychiatrist takes an oath to follow an ethical code of conduct, to put the care of their patients above all else. But of all medical disciplines, psychiatry has the worst record of fraud and abuse. Psychiatry is almost a license to print money. If a doctor were clever enough, and many of them are, there's no reason that they couldn't make at least a half million dollars a year fraudulently and get away with it in psychiatry. I don't purport to have deposed every psychiatrist in Las Vegas. I can tell you for a fact I haven't. Maybe I've deposed half. And by and large, they were a dishonest, deceitful, lying bunch of people. So prevalent are their deceptive and criminal billing practices. Insurance investigators have slang for it, like the California wave and the $100 handshake. $100 handshake is when usually a patient is uh, institutionalized. Psychiatrists, psychologists will visit that person, shake hands with them, say, hello, I'm doctor so-and-so, I'm taking care of your, your problem here, and then leaves. They might have 10 or 20 patients there. They bill an hour for each one, and they might be in the hospital for a total of 30 minutes. So 20 patients, 20 hours, and they'd send the bills off to Medicaid. We see that most of the victims of recovered memory therapy were women who had excellent health insurance, whether it was government insurance or private insurance, because many insurance policies wouldn't pay for this kind of long-term nonsense. So those people were targeted because of the nature of the insurance that they had. Every year, the U.S. psychiatric industry defrauds government and private insurance of $40 billion, using any means possible to deceive the public. There were some advertisements, very seductive advertisements, for people wanting to lose weight and were having problems losing weight. And they would be given, you know, all expenses paid to go to a particular spa. But when they got to this spa and went in and signed in, it wasn't a spa, it was a psychiatric center. And then they couldn't get out. What instead they received is they received massive doses of mind-altering drugs, and they were kept for a lengthy period of time, and their, their insurance carrier was billed tremendous amounts of uh, money for something that was unnecessary. But their lies go beyond the psych ward and into the courts, where as paid witnesses, they will say anything to collect their fee. A psychiatric expert who will have one opinion in one scenario and a completely opposite opinion in another scenario based on which law firm or governmental agency is paying for his time. The psychiatrist on one hand will tell the public that suicide can can be prevented but will go into court and tell a jury that suicide cannot be prevented and then once you show his prior inconsistent statements you also show that he is paid very well by pharmaceuticals then the jury says you know what we're not so sure about you um, because you just lied to us add to the greed dishonesty and avarice, their sex crimes. Accounting for only 6% of the physicians in the country, psychiatrists commit one-third of the sex-related offenses committed by doctors. It has happened so often that by the mid-80s, the insurance companies who insure physicians 
across America started writing sexual claims out of the policies altogether. That's how common it was. The system was so broken that more than 25,000 complaints had been registered, but nothing acted upon. When a psychiatrist has a patient, a female patient, and abuses them sexually, there's a very high probability they'll get away with it. I've seen many cases where the mental health professional becomes very disturbed and is using very strange and odd treatments, and that can go on for many years with no one finding out about it because it's not very public. It's quite private. Things happen behind closed doors. Tragically, their sex crimes often involve children. Case in point, Dr. C. Markham Berry. On the surface, a well-respected member of his community. But all that shattered when he was arrested on child molestation charges. Van loads of child pornography were removed from his home, and the subsequent investigation uncovered his sexual abuse of former patients, boys aged 7 to 17, who he photographed and sodomized all part of what the state called 50 years of Barry's rampant, undetected sexual escapades with children. This is not an isolated incident. It is the carefully masked character of the members of this profession. In every city, every state, every country, you'll find psychiatrists committing rape, sexual abuse, murder, and fraud. And as you will see, psychiatry's entire credibility depends on the biggest fraud of all. I was diagnosed with a chemical imbalance, manic depression. They diagnosed me with having ADD. He told me I had conduct disorder. ADHD. Mild depression. Major depression. Manic depressive. Borderline personality depression. disorder. Compulsive Social disorder. Anxiety. Depression and schizophrenia. ADHD. Depression. Sleep disorder. Identity problem disorder. There's no such thing as mental disorder. A mental disorder is whatever someone says it is, and if the person saying this is a mental disorder has enough power and influence, then people believe, oh, that's a mental disorder. But you can't have power or influence without credibility, so psychiatry manufactures its own. It's based on a, a, a grab bag of checklists for disorders that are published in a book called the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. There are no statistics in this book, by the way. That just makes it sound more scientific. They create this cluster of disease, and they get together and they vote. Is this a disease? All in favor say aye. It's marketed as a scientifically based document. Now, the American Psychiatric Association, which publishes the DSM, do a lot of work to create an, an aura of scientific precision around the DSM, but it's not scientifically based. Since the first edition of the DSM, the number of mental disorders voted into psychiatry's diagnostic manual has grown to 374. And with each new disorder, psychiatrists create yet another way to defraud the public. If you have 27 ways to bill in the DSM, that's 27 ways to bill. If you have 300, that's 300 ways to bill. So you could pretty much find anyone walking on the street that could fit into a DSM somehow. When you build an insurance company, you can't say the word. You've got to send a number. And they have numbers for the most ridiculous things, you know, like arguing with your mother or peeing in the bed. Adolescent rebellion disorder is an official psychiatric diagnosis. Um, Arithmetic learning disorder is an official psychiatric diagnosis. General anxiety disorder is a recent diagnosis. For each one, there is a five-digit code with a decimal point. Now, the implication of that is if I have uh, illness 403.16 that that's different in some important and scientifically proven way from someone who has 403.17 and nothing could be further from the truth. Incredibly enough, while presenting the DSM to the world as scientific fact, 
psychiatrists freely admit its utter lack of science. We have no diagnostic reliable markers for almost any illness there is in the DSM. What we're testing for in psychiatry, it's, it's hard to say because there's nothing specifically. But as far as a test that's clinically useful, um, you know, basically we're not there yet. We don't have any laboratory tests that we can use to uh, determine whether somebody does or doesn't have a mental illness. There are no good biological tests for detecting mental illness. There is no test, there's no biopsy you can do. There is no chemical test right now. There are no specific tests to confirm the diagnosis or show the improvement like any blood tests or any x-rays or anything like that. Oh, in my practice I don't do any tests. I just speak with people and uh, listen to them and then I make a decision in what kind of illness. These diagnoses vary as widely as the psychiatrists who make them. In this hidden camera footage, a person visited several different psychiatrists complaining of the same symptoms. I'm extremely unorganized and I didn't used to be. It's caused problems in the family, it's caused problems getting, you know, I'm, I'm self-employed. You've got ADD, ADHD, you depressed, and your depression is back over the breast. You have a brain chemistry disorder and it's probably genetic. You have a lot of the symptoms of depression. So it seems like it is a mixed picture. What that means is like we got some depressive symptoms and some, you know, high symptoms. So. If you're bipolar, I'll need to give you a mood stabilizer. Mm -hmm. I, we don't know, I kind of doubt it. It's considered low grade bipolar. You are more of the ADD than ADHD. And as far as medications for depression, because I would recommend that you start a medication which are Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Celexa. Usually, Procolin XR is pretty good. I'll give you some uh, Lexapro in the morning and some Trazodone at night. Lamectal is a better medication for that. It works on your depression also. And, but the treatment for any bipolar cycling is the uh, same. The lithium. Remeron is another one. Trazodone. Segretol. Depagod. Lobotrin. Lexaprone. Lamectol. Equatroid. Depagod. Lithium. Ambien. You may need an antidepressant also with, uh, with, with your Lamectol. We don't know if I give you a medication, if it is going to work or not. And to a certain degree, it's uh, trial and error. You never know if it's the right drug. How many people have I cured? Well, uh, there are no real cures right now in psychiatry. I have cured none of my patients. We're always challenged by our lack of knowledge. I mean, in fact, we don't know what the causes of mental illness are. Most mental illnesses, we do not know the cause. And of course, it would be nice to know exact reasons of disorders, but maybe in the future. I'm the uh, director of research at the American Psychiatric Association. We don't know the ideology of really any of the mental disorders at the present time. DSM-5 is coming out. It's grown to 10 times its original size, and it labels everybody. I could find five diagnoses that fit, would fit you or anybody else. Compare this to the research methods of pathology, a real science that discovers real diseases using a wide variety of precise diagnostic tests. We do millions of laboratory tests as well as the structural examination and the microscopic examination. It's um, a whole series of applied scientific procedures. In, in the case of, of psychiatry, there isn't any uh, laboratory tool that can precisely identify a psychiatric disease and allow it, allow it to be classified. It's not as if there's some study of tissue or some study of the body or some study of matter. These are all uh, categories which are made up they're simply made up. They're not, they don't exist in nature. They're uh, decided upon by psychiatrists and voted on. Psychiatrists are not the only ones who benefit from the DSM. Wherever you find a psychiatric diagnosis, you'll find a psychiatric drug. The pharmaceutical corporations now contribute enormous sums of money for the education of psychiatric residents and for the support of research by their professors so that psychiatry today has become very, in America, has become very largely uh, learning of which drug to use with which disease or disorder. We need to make sure that we understand the very close interactions among the American Psychiatric Association with its DSM, the pharmaceutical companies 
who love the fact that every time there's a new edition of the DSM, there are dozens more categories in there. And so more conditions for the drug companies to say, oh, we've got a pill for that. In 2006, a study revealed that 56% of all psychiatrists deciding what disorders to list in the next DSM had financial ties to at least one drug company. Today, we see the consequences. A barrage of drugs, each one targeted at an invented disorder that is backed by an arbitrary diagnosis found in the DSM. The fact that it is couched in the language of science without, again, without necessarily having any of the scientific data or, or underpinnings to justify it is as threatening as anything we've seen today. And psychiatry's latest and most expensive ploy to fool the public by imitating legitimate medicine? Brain scans. We can scan all the brains we want to. The fact that we see changes in different people's brains, changes in functioning, doesn't mean that we've discovered anything that has its origin in the brain. It just means that we're seeing changes, but it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the brain. Psychiatrists and psychologists use the DSM to label 450 million people worldwide as mentally ill. A total equal to the populations of France, Italy, Germany, Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom, and Russia combined. While sales of the psychiatric drugs they push have topped $27 billion annually, funding from world governments for these patients gross psychiatry $440 billion a year. And much of this money comes from the diagnosis and drugging of our most trusting and vulnerable. swallowed all manner of poisonous certainties fed us by our parents and school teachers. If the race is to be freed from its crippling burden of good and evil, it must be psychiatrists who take the original responsibility. Brock Chisholm's declaration typified the psychiatric onslaught aimed directly at our school system. They actually said that the purpose was social control. Not to pass on knowledge. Not to give him something so that he can go into the world of work. In 1950, psychiatrists and psychologists from around the world met at the White House to propose a total reorientation of the public school system. The White House Conference on Mental Health in the 1950s was a landmark that served to bolster the idea that schools would serve their communities better in the, as mental health clinics than they would as uh, institutions of learning. In the early 60s, the world of psychiatry started to really go places in this country, little by little. It came into our schools, our educational system. And by 1965, it was written into law. Psychiatrists were given the green light for the wholesale labeling and drugging of school children. A child is labeled ADD or ADHD the minute he can't uh, sit still for a well, 10, 15 minute period of time, uh, or he talks constantly or ignores the teacher completely, that will get him and earn him an ADD or ADHD label. The labeling of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, went into full swing in 1987. Within one year, 500,000 American children would be diagnosed as ADHD. By 1994, that number had soared to 4.4 million. In response to widespread public alarm at this apparent epidemic of mental disease, the U.S. government-funded National Institutes of Health assembled a panel of prominent doctors and psychiatrists to explain to parents and educators exactly what ADHD was. I would like uh, any member of the panel to describe uh, a typical ADHD in terms of symptomatology. 
Mark, would you like to? Since you see them in your practice. There, there I mean, I think the panel has been frank and, you know, the difficulties here are immense in terms of, of uh, um, these, I mean, <clears throat> ah, it is hard, it, it, it's very hard to know how to answer this question. There, um, they cannot, you know, even when, um, uh, they are as if driven by a motor. There are some good clinical descriptions. Um, and I think, you know, we, uh, I, I do, I think the pro part of the problem is the profession keeps changing the diagnosis. At this time, we do not have a diagnostic test for ADHD. Therefore, the validity of the disorder continues to be a problem. But this shocking admission did not stop school psychiatrists. Two years later, the number of American students diagnosed with ADHD had shot up to six million. Today, 20 million children worldwide are labeled with some form of learning disorder, a diagnosis often made in a matter of minutes. We would sit behind um, a two-way mirror um, w along with the parents. We would then look at um, the child. We would like do small manipulative activities with them to see where their deficit was. Um, it was wrong what we were doing. We were looking at a five minute glimpse of this child's life and saying, okay, here you go. Here's a little pill, take it, you'll be fine. Those little pills like Ritalin, Adderall, and Concerta are classified by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration as highly addictive substances, right along with cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine. When I was on the Ritalin, it made me just feel like totally different, like I wasn't even who I was. I was, you know, flipping out, was twitching, you know, going crazy. I felt like I was out of it all the time, like I wasn't there, I wasn't human. You're just a zombie, pretty much not, you, you, you know, you do what you can just to get by and just don't do anything extra. My mother never teased me, but she thought I really had ADHD and I was wrong, and I had something wrong with me. So I thought she'd feel bad and feel sorry for me if I died, but then again, I, I thought that she um, would miss me a lot and I also love her um, a little more than I wanted to kill myself. And so I stopped, I stopped when I realized that. The abundance of prescription medications created a new income source for kids, selling their meds to their schoolmates. It's called Kitty Cocaine. They take the Ritalin and they just repackage it and they sell it on campus to the kids because it's like speed. I figured like, if I was going to do drugs, I might as well make it worth it. And I ended up doing street drugs and then ended up getting into it really bad. We're looking at um, marijuana and other things as being gateway drugs, and actually the, the so-called medications are a greater gateway drug. The Ritalin drugs are backfiring big time because if the child is already disruptive and he takes cocaine, he's going to be a lot more disruptive after he's taken it. It is not going to calm him down. Boom, she got on the drugs and her personality changed, her behaviors changed, it became erratic and dark and violent and uh, it, it was just a nightmare. He kept having adverse reactions, becoming very, very angry. He could not control his behavior. He couldn't control his temper. He was on five different psych meds, Prozac and um, lithium and um, he was seven years old and he was unable to function. He would have rages and then crying and, and all kinds of um, just violent rages, grabbing knives and all of this. The list includes 15-year-old Kip Kinkle withdrawing from Prozac when he shot 22 classmates, killing two after murdering his mother and stepfather at his home in Springfield, Oregon. 18-year-old Jason Hoffman on Effexor and Selexa, and he opened fire at his California high school, wounding five. 
15-year-old Sean Cooper on a mix of antidepressants when he shot students in Idaho. And 17-year-old Eric Harris on Luvox when he and partner Dylan Klebold killed 12 classmates and a teacher in the bloodiest school massacre yet, Columbine. And all of this overshadows the very reason children came to school in the first place, to get an education. Since 1970, the United States has fallen from 9th to 28th place in worldwide academic standing. While during that same period, the number of American school children labeled with learning disorders has skyrocketed, and the sales of ADHD drugs have multiplied 32 times. Children don't ask for psychiatric drugs. Children don't ask to be diagnosed. They don't want to be called crazy. So you ask to ask the classic Roman question, legal question, cui bono, who benefits? The people who make the diagnosis. Psychiatry should actually go into government, that politicians should listen to psychiatrists. Psychiatrists should be in every parliament and should direct and monitor political activities. Psychiatry, in little more than a century, has infiltrated society on a global scale, and not by accident. People aren't aware that in 1940, a prominent British psychiatrist, Colonel J.R. Rees, addressed the National Council on Mental Hygiene and set the agenda for psychiatry for the next 60 years. Since then, psychiatrists have been given authority in nearly every sector of our society with tragic results. We must aim to make it permeate every educational activity in our national life. Public life, politics and industry should all of them be within our sphere of influence. We have made a useful attack upon a number of professions. The two easiest of them, naturally, are the teaching profession and the church. The most difficult are law and medicine. Reese's colleague, psychiatrist G. Brock Chisholm, co-founder of the World Federation for Mental Health, later expanded upon psychiatry's plans. To achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individualism, loyalty to family traditions, national patriotism, and religious dogmas. To implement their master plan, American psychiatrists convinced the U.S. Congress that mental illness was a national threat that only they, with vast increases in funding, could solve. And thus began massive U.S. government expenditures for psychiatric research which have climbed from $1 million a year in 1946 to $1.4 billion today, an increase of more than 139,000%. As psychiatric influence spread across America, it also spread throughout the world. Behind crisis after world crisis, you'll find the handiwork of psychiatry. Example, Serbian psychiatrist Jovan Ruskovic, who demanded the ethnic cleansing of Croats and Muslims because of his firm belief in their racial inferiority. The result, Bosnia in the 1990s, where Raskovic's colleague, psychiatrist Radovan Karadzic, and Prime Minister Slobodan Milosevic established Balkan concentration camps, where the mass torture, rape, and murder of the innocent happened once more. One military psychiatrist explained how it was done. C'est très difficile tuer un uh, million de personnes. C'est très difficile, techniquement difficile. Les Allemands étaient bons techniciens et ils ne pouvaient pas, uh, ils pouvaient seulement uh, 6 millions de Juifs exterminés. Ils massacrent, par exemple, 100 ou 200 de personnes ou uh, violent 100 Euh, euh, femmes et femmes, jeunes filles, pour que les autres sont effrayés et échappent. Alors, vous avez le terrain pur. With century-old Pavlovian conditioning, coupled with modern-day mind control techniques, 
psychiatrists and psychologists can turn average men and even children into mass murderers. You could train them to use firearms indiscriminately. You could train them to shoot people with very little feeling or thought. You could train them to use abusive and brutalizing procedures in order to obtain information with no hesitancy, with no concern. This is how terrorists are created. In the wake of 9-11, Osama bin Laden was characterized as the mastermind behind the attacks. But the acknowledged brain trust and commander of Al-Qaeda is Ayman al-Zawahri, educated in psychology and pharmacology at the University of Cairo, and the author of the Al-Qaeda training manual on the use of coercive psychiatry. And orchestrating the terrorist bombings in Madrid, Abu Hafiza, another Al-Qaeda operative, relying on those same techniques to manipulate the minds of men. You can implant memories. Memories are potent sources of motivated behavior. If you implant enough memories of specific kinds, you can shape and change the nature of human thinking and feelings. And it was thought to be a kind of ultimate weapon because what greater weapon could there be than control of the human mind. You can control minds and you can move people around, particularly when you control their lives. It's easier to control their minds. When we look at, uh, at psychiatry and psychology, social control is the primary agenda. And that agenda is being put in place throughout the world right now, using mental health screening campaigns fed to the public under such innocuous sounding names as Teen Screen. The national government is actually encouraging it and wanting to test every single kid in our public school system. All children are put under this kind of a test for psychiatric evaluation, a 10-minute test that tells them absolutely nothing. I predict that upwards of 90% of all the people screened will be diagnosed as having a psychiatric disorder, which means that we'll have an entire generation that will be a perfect profit center. The man behind the teen screen program, psychiatrist David Schaefer, consultant to the U.S. Department of Defense. They're not just uh, screening children to have complete control of the 52 million children in school. They're screening now, and that bill, they will screen uh, their parents, and they will screen all adults in America. The idea of mass screening for mental illness in the American population run by a government initiative is one of the scariest ideas I ever heard of. Psychiatry is politics, has always been politics. It is politics pure and simple because politics, psychiatry was always the application of force against people who don't want to be forced. It's a sad thing and parents better wake up. Society better wake up because we're in serious trouble if they don't. Psychiatry's master plan to infiltrate all sectors of society is becoming a reality. We don't have an epidemic of mental illness. We have an epidemic of psychiatry. Something can and must be done about it. Founded in 1969 by the Church of Scientology, the Citizens Commission on Human Rights investigates and exposes psychiatric violations of human rights. From its international headquarters in Los Angeles, California, CCHR documents psychiatry's invasive and destructive practices and publishes its findings, making them available in some 15 languages. More than 8 million copies have been distributed to healthcare professionals, government officials, educators, and business leaders world over. The headquarters is also the site of the world-renowned exhibit, Psychiatry, an Industry of Death. 
Centered around 14 documentary films, this state-of-the-art exhibition presents the history of psychiatry, from its origins, where the mentally ill were caged like animals, to the present-day mass drugging of society as the cure for invented mental disorders. Traveling versions of the exhibit visit hundreds of cities across five continents, opening the way for hundreds of thousands to discover for themselves the dark truth behind psychiatry. What is today a global human rights movement began more than 30 years ago with a fight for the freedom of one individual, Victor Giori, forcibly committed to a Pennsylvania psychiatric hospital. He was interviewed by a psychiatrist who said, I can't understand a word this man is saying. He's incoherent. Obviously, a paranoid schizophrenic. Commit him, which they did. Now, he wasn't babbling incoherently. He was speaking Hungarian. We filed a lawsuit against the hospital. In the middle of the case, the doctor, who was the head of the hospital, stands up and he says, we want nothing more to do with Victor Giori. The release of Victor Giori was the first of thousands of cases throughout the world, helped by CCHR. CCHR challenged involuntary commitment laws throughout the United States and internationally, and what we found was that people were being incarcerated without any legal rights. They had no right to an attorney. They could be drugged, shocked, lobotomized without their consent. Example, Australia, 1977 where CCHR exposed a psychiatric practice called deep sleep treatment. Patients were being knocked unconscious with a cocktail of barbiturates and other psychiatric drugs, and they were being subjected to electroshock treatment daily, sometimes twice daily, without their knowledge. Deep sleep treatment had led to 48 deaths. It was CCHR that investigated it, exposed it, and fought for over a decade until deep sleep treatment was banned. In South Africa, CCHR exposed psychiatric camps where mental patients were kept and brutalized and then farmed out as slave labor. In Italy, CCHR worked with legislators and the media conducting raids on psychiatric hospitals, the conditions of which were barbaric, and CCHR got them shut down. In Japan, CCHR exposed the financial crimes of psychiatrists and hospitals that were defrauding the government and taxpayers. The guilty were tried and the hospitals put out of business. And in the United States, CCHR uncovered a billion dollar fraud in the nation's largest chain of private mental health facilities. 600 federal agents conducted raids across 20 states. Dozens of prosecutions ensued millions in fines imposed, and the entire chain of corrupt hospitals was bankrupted and permanently closed. And behind every public warning you see today about psychiatric drugs is CCHR. CCHR has documented the side effects of these drugs, has taken evidence to the FDA, has gone to Congress, has obtained congressional hearings. It took 13 years before the FDA finally admitted that those drugs can cause suicide and issued black box warnings. We got nine state laws passed. Following that, it was the introduction of the Child Medication Safety Act in 2004. In the last three years alone, there have been more than 50 international drug regulatory agency warnings exposing the dangers of psychiatric drugs. History has told us every workable method that could be used to help people who are seriously disturbed, who do need some sort of treatment, has been suppressed and smashed by the vested interests of psychiatry and the pharmaceutical industry. The public's largely been getting their information from the industry that benefits on putting them on psychiatric drugs. It's an advertising campaign. It's not science, it's marketing. CCHR is causing things to change by being champions for a growing number of well-intentioned people who are risking their professional careers to speak up against the abuses of psychiatry. Having that support from a group like this has made a tremendous difference in what I feel personally that I've been able to accomplish. So I think of CCHR as, as fellow soldiers. I'm unaware of any other organization that does the kind of work that CCHR does, particularly on the, the scope and the level that they do. CCH has been very effective at moving the ball down the field, one at a time, one state at a time, one legislator at a time. CCHR has had the resources to be able to teach 
and have legislators become more aware of what the problem with the psychotropic drugs are. CCHR has researched the issue. When you need the facts, you go to CCHR. Today, CCHR has over 300 chapters in dozens of countries around the world. Wherever and whenever psychiatrists abuse human rights, CCHR takes its message to the streets. From the United States to Japan, and from Canada to the United Kingdom, prominent members of CCHR lead marches to secure the protection and freedom from psychiatric abuse for everyone. It's essential that CCHR does their job and gets the support to do their job because the extent to which they do, the whole vehicle that's out of control about psychiatry gets to be contained and gets to be eliminated. It scares me to think if this doesn't happen. I've seen up close what it's like and it scares the daylights out of me. You have 100,000 people electroshocked every year. You have 17 million children worldwide taking mind-altering drugs. You have people being involuntarily committed every 75 seconds, and it's all under the guise of mental health. The only way that you are going to get humane treatment into the mental health system is to take psychiatry and the vested interests out of the picture. And only then will you see people truly obtaining mental health. You have two choices. Either you pretend you knew nothing about it or you do something about it. With knowledge comes responsibility. That's why we're here. That's why people are joining forces with CCHR. Thousands from every faith and walk of life have already joined. CCHR investigates and exposes psychiatric violations of human rights and will continue to do so until psychiatry's abusive and coercive practices cease and human rights and dignity are returned to all. Your help is needed. Join us in the fight.